And again, it is Friday, the 29th of July, and we're in Oglethorpe County Public Library in Lexington with Mr. Hubert Aaron. Hey, Robert. And Mr. Aaron, I'm wondering if you could share with us the memories you have of the World War II era. After 50 years, I'll try. <laughs> I've tried to suppress them, what you might say, for 50 years, so you probably won't get too many war stories out of me. But I, I joined it, uh, well, I didn't join I, I was drafted in service in 1942. I don't remember this date much so forth and so on. Got my basic training in Fort McClellan, Alabama. And I was an infantryman. Went over, I was sent overseas as a replacement where I joined the 3rd Infantry Division in uh, Tunisia, uh, Tunis, Tunisia. You have the Kathleen Pass. Now that's where I got my first action. And it didn't take us long to capture the rest of Africa there. And then from there we went to Sicily. And that was my first invasion that I participated in. And we fought through Sicily. And the biggest thing I remember about Sicily was we were taking the town of Palermo, Sicily. And after that, we, we captured the entire island. And then the, later on, the 36th Infantry Division invaded at, uh, Salerno, Italy. And we went in about three or four days behind them. And uh, of course, we went to we captured Naples and we headed north from Mount Vesuvius, the famous volcano over there. The next action we were in was crossing the Volcano River, where we had quite a bit of action there. And, and we lost our company commander there. He killed my uh, booby trap. And uh, of course, it was almost hand-to-hand -hand fighting from there, from, from place to place as we went along. And uh, we got up to uh, Casino, a little town called Casino. And boy, we had all kinds of problems there. And, and, uh, and the next thing I knew, my, my outfit was relieved from there. We came back to Naples, and, and uh, my unit made an invasion at Anzio to so-called uh, Eased the front down at Casino, but I don't think he did any easing there or Angelo either because we, we spent four months there mired up in, in the mud and couldn't move. And uh, it was just day to day in, in the mud and artillery shells, bombs, and what have you falling every place. I was wounded uh, there on Angelo sent back to Naples for three weeks and then come right back in the same area. A little bit later, we uh, made an advancement on to Rome. We captured Rome on June the 5th, 1944. And that was the day before the Normandy invasion on June the 6th. And that was such a large operation on June the 6th that it just overshadowed everything we did. And you never hear anything about it, not even to this day, you, you never hear anything about that uh, capture of Rome. I heard a little bit this year on the 50th anniversary of that capture of Rome. Is that right? Of course, it, you heard more about it. Oh yeah, no, but, that, that, that's right. It was, but I did. That was a huge operation there. And then we occupied the city of Rome for a couple of weeks. My unit did, the 3rd Infantry Division. From there we went back to Naples, we'd seen no more action in Italy. So we'd taken more amphibious training and we, uh, on the 15th of August, 1944, we invaded, the, uh, my unit hit the beach at St. Tropez, southern France. And uh, there was a rat race going up through all those little towns there. And uh, we, 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 the 3rd Infantry Division got together with the 36th Infantry Division, and we, we hemmed in uh, the 11th Panzer Division, I believe it was, the, the German division fighting against it. And we, uh, we had completely annihilated that unit at uh, Mount, uh, Mount Lamar was the name of the little town. And from there, it was just, we just fought our way on up. Well, just a little bit later, we joined up with the Norman, Normandy Front, coming in from Normandy, and then to push on into uh, Germany. And uh, we crossed the Rhine 
near Würzburg, Germany, I believe it was. I, I, I don't remember the exact name of the town. It was, it was out in the country, but it was a little town nearby. I don't remember the name of it. And then just a little while later, I got machine gun bullet wounds to my left leg, and of course I was evacuated, and that was the end of my combat experiences. But uh, I, I know I've, I've left out a lot here because I, I went a long ways here from uh, 42 and until 44. And all the way around the Mediterranean. Oh yeah, all over the Mediterranean. I, my, my wound was, the last wound was uh, September 25th, 1944. My leg was amputated the first day of October 1944 at Naples, Italy, at 45th General Hospital. And a few days later, my company commander at that time, at the time I was wounded, Captain Frank Williams, he was also wounded, and he was sent back to the same hospital I was in. And of course, I didn't know, but he came and visited me one, one night. It was, it was a pleasant surprise, maybe I said, Ed. And uh, we, we had quite a few visits there before I regained strength to be able to be sent back home to the States. And uh, that's the last I've seen of the fellow. And since I joined the Society of the Third Infantry Division, I learned that he had died a couple of years before I joined it. And I never, I never get to see the man again. So that, that, that's about it for me. Tell about that dry creek bed that you went up. No, that was uh, uh, the day we landed in southern France. It wasn't a creek bed. It, it was a, just a gully washout. Where we, where we, let me go back to the beginning. When we hit the beach, the LCVP that put us off, put us off up the beach quite a ways from the rest of the unit. And therefore, we, we was out of position. And of course, we went on inland. That, that's the only invasion I ever made that I didn't get my feet wet. And uh, of course, my, my whole platoon was, was pinned down with machine gun fire. And the, uh, the platoon leader, I forget the Lieutenant Green, I believe his name was. I, I don't remember his name. He wanted to pull back and, and go around the other way and join the rest of the company. And I knew if we one time turned our back on those boogers, I knew exactly what would happen to us. But we had them pinned down, same as they had us pinned down. But he, he got the rest of the uh, platoon and went on back. He even took my squad with him. And uh, he won't have me court martial. But, uh, I mean, that was his threat. But I, I wasn't worried too much about a darn court martial. Never was. I, I, anyway, uh, I got the last man that went by me to stay with me and, and, and keep firing at, over that position, over, over the area where the enemy was out there. They went in for the mid to just across the street over there from us. But then I worked my way around the edge of the woods. And sure enough, here, here's a big gully wash out down there. It was about four foot deep. I was armed with a Thompson 45 submachine gun. And I had all kind of bandoliers, you know, magazines on me. And I eased my way up through there, and sure enough, the one around the curve, and there's a machine gun, two guys there. Well, you know what happened. I mean, I'm, I'm here, and they're there. I left those two guys laying on the ground, stepped over one body, worked my way on around, and there's a communication a radio outfit up there with three or four guys around. I don't, I don't want so many guys around the radio, but they, they found out what I was there. But once some of them was killed, some of them was wounded. I, I don't remember this, what happened to each one. Anyway, I worked my way all the way to the upper end of that ditch, and when I got up there, I had 19 prisoners. I had three or four, I, I don't know how many lay on the ground wounded, and there were six dead Germans there. And I, I carried those prisoners back to this boy that I told you I had to wait for me. I turned them over to him, and he carried them back down to the beach and turned them over to the uh, Navy or whoever was accepting prison at that time. I don't know. I, I, anyway, I, I knew where we were going, so I told him where to come to. And he came up and then told my company commander, Frank Williams, what had happened. And I, as a result of that action, I received the second award of the Silver Star.
And Mr. Maxwell, I could tell you dozens of those kind of stories, but I, I just don't like to elaborate on them. How was the food on the ships that you was waiting, going from across the ocean uh, or across the Mediterranean? Did they feed you really? pretty good? Do what? Did they feed you pretty good? Best food I've eaten in my life. And a good warm place to sleep. See, we trained on those L L LCT, uh, I think LCT, I, I, I don't remember the name of those ships. LST, I guess it was, yeah. Again, yeah, that was real good too. I bet a lot of people don't know how big one of those boats are. How big is it? How wide is it? And how many men was on it? And how long was it? Uh, I don't have any idea how many men were there. I know my entire company was on it, plus trucks and all kind of uh, artillery pieces down in the hole. I have no idea how many men was on that uh, LST. See, we, we, we only used them in training. Now, uh, it, well, we did in transportation too from, from uh, Naples over to, uh, we went through the island, of, between the island of Sardinia and, and the other island, I forget the name of it. One belonged to France. One belonged to France and one belonged to uh, Italy. Uh, on our way to the invasion. And then we got off of the, those things into LCVPs to hit the beach with. And like I said earlier, that's the only invasion I made while I was over there that my foot left the ramp and hit dry sand. Most of the time I had to wade in water up so deep. <laughs> uh, as I think about this now, back to Anzio, if you want to hear a war story, I'll tell you a good one. There's no one in that story. I was relieved of uh, the frontline duty with my one little squad now to go back in company reserve. That's what they call company reserve. You go back behind the front line for maybe, maybe four, five, six hundred feet. I, I really don't know how far it was. Back, back out of, well, it was, you're still in a lot of danger, but not like up on the front line. And uh, I had my boys to dig in in a defensive position, you know, on what we call the military slope of the hill. I don't know what, if you know what the military slope of the hill is or not, but I do. Uh, anyway, we real quiet and, and, and we got to rest some. And early in the morning, I don't know if it was the first morning or the second morning, I don't remember about that. We heard somebody over across a little stream from us, just a little branch, and there was a hill. We heard somebody over there digging in, making all kind of noise. And we couldn't figure it out. We knew what, we didn't have any men over there. There wasn't supposed to be anybody over there. And, and, and they want my, my boys come crawling up to my foxhole and want to know what to do. And uh, I said, well, go back and get in your hole. And then later on, I'll let, I'll let you know what to do as soon as I find out something. Of course, I was on my little radio talking to the company commander. Of course, he was up in front of me. He didn't know what it was. And he got on the telephone talking to the battalion. They didn't have any men up there. And when I heard that news, Man, I didn't know what to do. But after in a little while, I started getting just a little daylight out there where we could see a little bit. And I could see from the equipment that those guys had, it, it wasn't, wasn't Americans. But we also had, uh, we had a few Arabs over there. We had a few Englishmen. We had different nationalities over there fighting, so I, I didn't want to do anything rash. But then it got a little bit lighter. And then I did know what to do. It was an entire company of Germans that got over on the hill facing me, on the slope coming down facing me. And they, it was so hard that they couldn't dig in real quick. So we caught them, so to speak, uh, with, the, with the pants down. And I told my guys to open up, fire, you know, follow my lead. And, and, and when I started firing, they did too. And within five minutes, we had captured the entire company of German soldiers. One little squad of men. And that, that's about the best one I know to tell you. One, one squad of men capturing the whole company. Did you have a pretty good kitchen after you hit the beach? Did the feed you pretty good then? Uh, we didn't know what the kitchen was after we were in the front line. They, they bring food up to us occasionally. But most of the time we had C rations and K rations. Uh, and our bread was dog biscuits. 
I bet you these young folks don't know what K ration and C ration is. Could you no, describe sir. I hope, that? I hope they never find out. Describe what was. Why don't you enlighten us? Why? Why don't you enlighten us? Oh man! It just C rations. Let's see. What were they consisted of? Uh, meat and vegetable soup, meat and vegetable beans, and I don't know what else. Uh, but uh, had a little gas stove, a little one burner stove, and you mess it, man. Man, you could cook up something there. So that's this the neighbor's the neighbor's garden put a few onions in with it and this kind of stuff. Which we did some of that. And K rations? The K rations was better than the C rations. But uh being the front line troops, you, you didn't get too many K rations. The fellas back behind us got most of those. Uh, <laughs> they they had they rated a little bit better than we did. Yeah. But, did you get any food from the local people, like uh, hens and eggs and anything no, like that? They, they, those people were in worse shape than we were in. They didn't even have they didn't even have C rations or K rations. And then no, I, I didn't see a chicken the whole time I was over there. But I did see a lot of onions and potatoes and a few ears of corn now and then. And, and really, I, I don't remember about all the rest of the vegetables, but, but we did pretty good. And then when, when they had vegetables. If I tossed out a name or two, would you tell me what you thought of, say, General Patton? Yes, I know the gentleman, if you want to call him a gentleman. But I call him SOB. Not a sweet old boy. I remember one thing he told us in Sicily. And I won't use the words he used. But he said, if you've got to get shot and get killed, try to fall forward and capture that much more ground. And from then on, he wasn't, he was nothing in my book. Who else? Would you, would the name General Montgomery bring something else to mind? I didn't know him all that well. Uh, I heard of him quite a bit. Now, if you want to call another gentleman's name, I know him, Lucian K. Truscott. He's the gentleman we learned the Truscott trot under. And I remember something he told me. That the entire division, we passed in the view and came up in, in, in formation and stood in front of his podium. He, he stood up with his shiny helmet on and he looked back and forth among all those men out there. And he says, among you men today, I see many new faces. The next time I stand before you men, I see many more new faces. And for all of the young recruits that just came in, I wonder how that made them feel, because that's the guys he was talking to. These old, old fellows had dirty uniforms and rusty helmets and mud all over the helmets, but these new guys with brand new, brand new outfits on it shiny helmet and all this kind of stuff. And all, every one of them was just like I was, everybody else, they didn't know what they was in for. And I, <laughs> I've often wondered how they made those fellas feel. <laughs> but somehow, though, thank God I survived it. How did the name Foxhole come about, do you know? I don't have any idea. But I'll tell you one thing. There were certain places over there when it was, when the weather was dry, the ground was hard, and then bullets start flying, and, and you're trying to advance, and all of a sudden all this action takes place. You've got your little entrenching tool, and you lay it flat on your back, and you fix that thing like it might be a, uh, a mattock or something, and you lay there on your back trying to dig a foxhole like so. It takes you a long time to dig it even with the bullets flying. <clears throat> but other places where the soil was soft, I've dug a million in 10 minutes or less. Deep enough for me to get here. Can you tell me something about joining up? About growing up? Growing up? 
growing up <laughs> connection to here or I was I was meaning to ask about joining up but well, if that I, either I, I was born in, in, in Oglethorpe County Georgia down in what you call the old Flatwood section of Oglethorpe County on October the 18th 1923 and I was raised in this county as, as a son of a, a farmer <coughs> so <laughs> Well, I, I, I what does that say about a farmer? He, he's just a poor dirt farmer, that's all he ever was. I, and incidentally, I was one of 16 children, all single births, to one father and one mother. There's 13 of them living to this day, ranging age from 48 to 79. How many of them are in service? Two of you. Two of you. James and one another. James didn't go in until after I came home from the war. Uh, but now later on, Milton went in. Uh, you know, Milton served in the occupation forces in Germany for, I don't know, one or, one or two uh, enlistments. I, I, I don't, don't remember. But that was way after the war. He was much, much younger than me. Would you like some more of that water? No, thank you. Were your medics pretty much close behind you or the... Oh, the oh, I had one medic, uh, eight men, right, right in my couple, in my platoon all the time. Uh -huh. and, and the last time I was wounded, uh, he, he was there within, within two minutes. And, and the first thing I knew, he opened up a little, little tube that looked like uh, I guess you'd call it tinfoil or something. I don't know what he stuck the dog on thing. He did. By that time, he had took his little clippers and or scissors and cut my pant leg open. He stuck me in the thigh with that dog on whatever it was. There's a little toothpaste tube with a needle in the end of it and morphine on the inside. <laughs> whatever it was, it put me on cloud nine, and it, I didn't worry about nothing. But, every, uh, every, every foot soldier and flying folks had those. Yeah, I guess so. But now, uh, really, I, I was evacuated within within 20 minutes of being shot. The last time I was shot, and uh, the company commander sent his jeep up and got me. And the, somehow they got, they had a stretcher there and put it across the, the hood of the jeep. And put, well, I was wondering when he put it up there, strapped that thing down and kept it back by the co company commander's CP, as he called it. He was in a ditch bank over there. And he come out and talked to me, shook my hand. And I didn't see him no more until later on he was wounded. But in the meantime, between the time I was wounded and, and, and a couple, three weeks later when he was wounded, he was uh, promoted to battalion executive officer. And uh, according to the last letter I got from him, he, he went right back to that same job. But he, he didn't, didn't last long. His, his ankle gave him a lot of trouble from that accident he was in. Mine hit a jeep, a uh, jeep hit a mine, whatever, and uh, broke his foot and ankle pretty bad. And uh, I don't think he was able to walk too well for quite some time. Do y'all, your unit have uh, reunions now every 10 or 12 years? We have a reunion every year. Yeah. Where, where are this, all over the states? Uh, well, it, it, it starts out on the west coast one year and then to the midwest the next year and east coast the next year. And then start all over again. Uh, this year we're having it at Fort Benning in, in September. Fort Benning, Georgia. I don't remember the dates. But uh, that's where most of, most of them got their training prior to uh, World War II. And World War II. <clears throat> Does that mean you didn't get basic training? At, did, did you train at Fort Benning? No, no, I got my training at Fort McClellan, Alabama. Mm -hmm. See, I didn't, I, uh, I didn't go in. I was too young to go in at the beginning of the war. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the unit got the training there, and they went over and, and uh, they made the initial invasion at Casablanca, North Africa, on November the 8th, 1942. And, of course, I joined them up in 43. And... Uh, Went on like a toy through Sicily and Italy and 
so did France into Germany. Can you tell me anything about coming home? Yes, sir, I can tell you about coming home. <laughs> we came back by ship, landed in Boston, Massachusetts, and they, they put all the uh, fellows like the amputees on a train and uh, sent, sent us out to Camp Edwards, Massachusetts. And we were there for about three days and, and then they uh, had us all processed on where we were going, this one, that, that hospital, whatever. And they had me down for uh, McCloskey General Hospital, Temple, Texas. I didn't want to go, but I did. Anyway, they put us aboard a C-47 plane. I don't remember the date, but uh, we flew down the coast, right over New York City, down to Virginia someplace, and had to land for refueling. And from there we turned west, went over the mountains. And we landed in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. And they unloaded us there off the plane and they carried us up to the Naval Hospital. We were to spend the night there. The next morning we woke up, we went in. A little tornado, uh, 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 not a tornado, but a, a hurricane came through. So we spent five days and nights in that Naval Hospital. And we were finally able to load us up aboard the plane and carry the Texas on out to uh, Temple, Texas. And I was only there a couple of weeks with the redress my leg, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And gave me a new uniform. And the next thing I knew, I had a 30 day pass. Uh, got aboard a bus up in Temple, Texas. And it took me about a day and a half to get to Atlanta. And that's where one of my sisters met me. And uh, from there we rode a bus together to the Athens bus depot. And a friend of mine was uh, operating a cab. So he seen me get off the bus on crutches. And he called me over and I went over and he said, I, want, I know where you want to go. So we got in his cab and then he carried me home to my, down to my father and mother's house in the Wolfskin section of Old Five County. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a nice reception committee there, maybe I should say. My entire family was there to meet me. <laughs> and uh, of course we had a big celebration. I, mean, I guess they were glad to see me, I don't know. I know I was glad to be home. Was the wall still going when you got home? Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, in, in fact, I got home December the 17th, 1944, before the uh, Battle of the Bush started on the 22nd, 23rd of December. So I listened to every bit of that on the radio, and I, I fell for a little while. I knew what those boys were going through. But uh, thank goodness I was home. Do you think there were heroes and villains in those days? Pardon? Do you think there were heroes and villains in those days? I don't know about heroes, but there was a lot of villains, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I, I, I guess Audie Murphy, which he happened to be in my unit, he, he was probably a hero. Uh, now, I, I had the privilege of being a squad leader of another man. It's pretty well known. Uh, on Anzio, I was a squad leader of Matt Dillon, James Arnett. Uh, but uh, not all that long, I was. He, he got wounded, uh, got shot in the foot or leg or something like that. I don't know what his wound was. But uh, he didn't spell his last name then like he does now. He had a U A U R A N E S S. But uh, really, he 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 was on uh, gun smoke for quite some time before I even recognized it. Forever. Yeah. In some of the wall movies that you see uh, since the war, do uh, they have a little comedy part in it? Like one unit is always stealing the uh, food from another one, uh, a jeep from each other, or something. Did y'all ever have any problems? Uh, 
going to some other unit like the Navy mm -hmm. and getting yeah. something to eat. Or... Man, you didn't have time to go to another unit if you didn't come back. All you knew was that darn war right in front of you. And so far as you was concerned, the entire war fought right in front of you. I mean, what the fellow over there was doing, what the fellow over there was doing, you didn't know. You didn't have time to take care of his business. You had business in hand in front of you. And brother, you better take care of it. If you didn't, he'd take care of you. What have you been doing since that era? Well, I had two occupations after I came back home. Number one, I became a body and fender repair, an automobile painter. But I had a little unfortunate thing that happened to me. I wound up in the late 50 with a brain tumor. And I had that taken care of in 62. I came back home, and believe it or not, I just fell into the electrical trade, which I learned real easy. Within a year's time, I had my own state license, and I was on my way. So for 30 years, I practiced uh, electrical work. If you were talking to an audience of younger people, high school or college age, about those days, World War II era, what would you want to leave them to think about? That this is the greatest country God ever put on this earth. The greatest country in the world is worth fighting for. And if I had to do it all over again, I would probably do it under the same circumstances. But as we mature, we look back on some of the things we did earlier in life. I know I do, and I ask myself a question. Would it, it, would it really worthwhile? But after thinking it over, yes. Under the same circumstances, I'll go back in a, in a minute. Do the same thing all over again. That's about it. Is there anything you'd like to add to the record here? I think I've said about all. I'm very grateful for your time, sir. Thank you, sir.